Hello everyone, welcome to the shop. Today we're going to be talking about making custom cutters, and I'm going to make a custom cutter for a different project that will be the subject of another video, but I thought making this custom cutter would be a good subject for a little video of its own. Any of you that have followed me on my blog already know that I kind of have a fondness for making my own cutters whenever I sort of have the excuse to. So I thought I'd quickly show you some of the cutters that I've made over the past few years. With my interest in machining largely coming from watch repair and watchmaking, I ended up learning some techniques to make my own drill bits pretty early on. If you read any of the old watchmaking texts, you'll find information about making what are sometimes called spade drills. Different than what you might be thinking of if you have a woodworking background. And I was pretty terrible about marking my cutters and drill bits with the sizes until just recently. So I tend to keep them in these little bags here just so I know what's what. This is probably the smallest one that I've made so far. This is a little 0.75 millimeter spade drill. And this is the uh, drill size for tapping M1 threads. Let's see if we can get a close-up of this here. Pretty tiny. Stuff like this I tend to make on the little watchmaker's lathe. But this same pretty simple technique for making spade drills is useful for larger drills also. So I had a need once for a 333 thousandths drill bit. With something this size, it's a little easier to see how these are made. There's not a whole lot to them. They're pretty effective. This one is a 6.8 millimeter left hand cutting drill bit. I don't recall why I needed that. Here's another left handed spade bit. It looks like I didn't mark the size. Guess that'll be a mystery. Another real useful type of cutter that's not too difficult to make yourself is uh, counterbores. Uh, useful for things like counterboring uh, holes for screw heads. I've made several, some with, some without pilots. These are all pretty small. There's a larger one here. This is an example of one that I drilled for a pilot that can be removed. Having the pilot hole going through it there makes it actually a little bit easier to form the cutting edges. Here's another counter bore with the removable pilot in the baggie here. Here's another spade bit I made. The difference with this one being the extended shank that I put onto it so that it could reach a little bit further than I'd normally want to with a spade drill. 3.3 millimeters. That was a mm, that was a size needed for tapping metric threads of some dimension, as I recall. Perhaps M4. I don't have a tap drill size chart in front of me. Another slightly unusual tool that I've made, not technically a cutting tool, but worth mentioning here, is this 
countersink burnisher as I called it, or rotary burnisher. Just take it out of the bag here. It has a domed end that was polished and then sort of radially abraded. If you look real close, let's see if I can get a close-up of this in a minute. But there were abrasion marks going from the center of the dome outwards all the way around. And that's probably been somewhat disturbed after using this a few times, but it's like you'd expect from you know a traditional burnishing tool that a watchmaker would use just in a, a radial form here. And I use this to put a nice burnished, almost riveted looking edge around some holes in the heart locket that I made. Again, some of you who followed me on Tumblr in the past might remember that heart locket. That was a neat little project. So this is just plunged into the work, into an existing hole with plenty of oil. See if we can get a close up of this here. I've had a few occasions for making custom reamers. This is a very small 10 degree reamer. And this is pretty well the same idea as a spade bit as far as how the relief is formed behind the cutting edge. That was very effective. Another cutter I made that was really useful is this, uh, I guess you'd call it an annular cutter. Annular cutters can be very expensive, so this was pretty worthwhile to make and have on hand immediately. If you look, the cutting edges are pretty goofed up. I messed up the heat treating of this and I was in too much of a hurry to really do it properly. The cutting edges up here ended up being softer than they really should have been. The cutting edges dulled several times throughout using it. So I had to continually grind to, uh, to sharpen them. That's why they look all messed up. This is really the only cutter I've made and used that I've had a problem with the, the cutting edge. And it was just my own fault for not taking a little more time with the heat treating. And I made that for something that might also look familiar to those of you who follow me on Tumblr. This little quick change tool post that I made for the watchmaker's lathe needed a feature formed in the body for this locking barrel to go into. So this cored out hole right here is the reason that I made that cutter. This old Tony recently had a video about making a little uh, espresso maker. He had a similar but much larger feature to mill. He used a, a rotary table on the milling machine. And that versus making some sort of custom cutter like this are really the only feasible methods I can think of to do something like this. <clears throat> if I had a little rotary table for the mini mill when I was making this. In fact, I didn't even have the mini mill when I was making this. I had a little Barker horizontal milling machine. Then that might have been the way to go. And given what I had on hand at the time, the custom cutter worked out pretty well. Another type of cutter that comes in pretty useful from time to time that's really not too difficult to make in the home shop, these multi-tooth style of cutter. This is a six tooth cutter that I made that was sort of a gear cutter, except I didn't really put much effort into making a real gear tooth profile. 
it was more just for practice of uh, the mechanics of cutting gears versus trying to make an actual functioning gear. The cutter that we make in today's episode is going to be similar to this where it's a multi-tooth style cutter meant to be mounted on an arbor. And you can see this doesn't have a keyway cut into it. For a cutter this small that's meant to take such light cuts, it really doesn't need one. And while you're at it, making things out of tool steel and heat treating them, making your own drill bushings like this is sometimes really useful too. This is a drill bushing I made for a I think I marked this one. Yeah, for a 155,000 drill bit. So when I gather it all together and look, there really is quite a few shop made cutting tools that I've made and gotten good use from over the years. Really, just don't be afraid to try it. It's not that difficult. It takes some practice in most cases, especially when it comes to making the little spade bits. You don't need a lot of real intricate machine set up for the small cutters. You can do a lot of the forming of the relief angles and things by hand with a file. And that's kind of what I'm going to show you in this episode. Just mostly don't be afraid to fail a few times and ruin the part that you're working on. I ruined plenty. You do have to be a little careful with the very small spade bits and things like that because they can actually warp during heat treating but there are some tricks you can use to minimize that. We'll start with a piece of quarter inch thick O1 steel plate. We'll blue it up so we can use a simple layout technique to find the center. With the work mounted in the four jaw chuck on the lathe, we need to start by drilling and boring the center to fit the arbor that I'll be using for this cutter. I just love these Starrett telescoping bore gauges. They're a relatively recent acquisition, and I don't know how I went so long without having a good set. They really are incredibly useful. Now over to the bandsaw to knock off the corners from the work. This will greatly speed up the time it will take to turn the outside diameter of the cutter. With the work mounted to the arbor, we can chuck the arbor up into the lathe to turn the outside diameter of the work to form our cutter blank. The work holding arrangement here had me limited to really light cuts. I was taking 5,000 steps of cut per pass, so it took a while. We'll use the mill to form the cutting teeth, and we'll do this in several stages. We'll use a square collet block to determine the positions of the teeth. That means we'll end up with a cutter that has four teeth, one for each side of the square collet block. The first series of cuts will form the face of each tooth. 
I'm using a 3 8 inch diameter roughing end mill here. The next series of cuts will remove the waste stock in front of each tooth face. The last series of cuts will form the bulk of the relief behind each cutting tooth. The rough cutter is now formed, and the remaining work will be done by hand. Now for once I'm going to remember to stamp this cutter with its size. Here's where the namesake of this video comes in. Where each cutting tooth should come to a point, there is still a small section of the original outer diameter remaining, and we need to hand file a relief up to this point. Coloring in this small area to be removed acts like a guide, and it works surprisingly well. For such a small area like we have here, just a small touch of blue permanent marker works pretty well. The relief behind each tooth is filed away until there remains just a thin blue line. The last little sliver of material to be removed in order to form a perfectly sharp cutting edge will be done after the part is hardened. When it comes to heat treating carbon tool steels in the home shop, there is a lot of great information online. Unfortunately, there is also quite a bit of misinformation. While this is an important part of making the cutter, there is just too much that can be said about heat treating for me to get into a lot of the details here. The basics are that we're using an oil hardening steel and also using a coating of a paste made from boric acid and denatured alcohol to help prevent scaling during hardening. To further simplify things, we'll be leaving the cutter glass hard or full hard, so we won't get into tempering here. In a nutshell, we need to heat the cutter thoroughly to a red heat, and then quench it in the oil. The temperature required varies a little bit for different types of steel. With some patience, you really don't have to be very scientific about it. With some practice, you'll be able to tell by eye when the steel is about the right temperature, and you may have to repeat the process several times before getting the results that you're after. In our example here, you'll see that I had to make several attempts with this part. This is just about the largest part that I'd want to attempt with a small torch like this in the home shop. Anything larger and you really need a lot more heat. You can also see that this part was a little bit too large for the steel binding wire I was using. Using a file is a quick and easy way of checking the hardness of your part. If everything works, the file should skate right over the surface of the part without digging it at all. The hard coating left by the boric acid is easily removed in some boiling water.
The final step is to stone the cutting teeth. That small amount of material that we left when filing the relief behind the cutting teeth will get stoned away now to leave a sharp cutting edge. I'm sure the cutter will work just fine, but to make sure, we're going to try it out in a scrap piece of aluminum. I'll start by milling a slot, and then I'll make a plunge cut directly into the piece. In a subsequent video, I'll be using this milling cutter on some steel, and it will be used to make a series of plunge cuts like this. I think this cutter will work just fine. Thanks for watching everyone.